T1. And, for, and, and similarly, it linearly interpolates VT2. Right? And then now, I'm going to linear interpolate this way to get the alpha value. This is called bilinear interpolation. Right? And you see by cubic interpolation, you can guess what that's going to do. Right? This is going to put fit cubics vertically and then cubics horizontally and go one at a time. Now, an important property to check when you do a grid-based interpolation scheme like this is that it doesn't matter what order you did it in. Right? Now, if I interpolated in x and then y, and got a different answer from interpolating in y and then x, that would be a very bad method for interpolation, because somehow that's preferring different grid directions. Right? But in fact, almost any strategy you can, you can possibly write down is symmetric in x and y, and, and, and that's, that's unlikely to happen. But it is something you've got to do homework. So the remaining seven minutes of class, we can try and summarize about 200 years of development on uh, functional analysis. Um, so, so obviously today we've drawn a lot of pictures, which is something I don't like to do in 205. Or rather, I like to do it in tandem with developing the, 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 the company of mathematics, but we kind of skipped part two there. Um, and that's because the, the, the math here, it's actually not that hard, but it does require a little bit of development that we haven't had. So I'd say one theme that we have had in this class is that we started out by just dividing dot products, right? Dot products between vectors. And then we started messing with the dot product, and we noticed we could do lots of things with it, right? First, we introduced the Mahalanobis metric. Later on, for example, last week, right, we were talking about A conjugate and A orthogonal directions for uh, conjugate gradients, right? So in fact, what really matters, if you remember all the way back to that homework problem that everybody hated, is there are a couple properties of dot products that make dot products dot products. Right? Like they're symmetric, you can flip them back and forth, and that they're linear in the two slots, and so on. Right? And it turns out that there are lots of operators that sort of have this list of properties, and they can be used to make versions of linear algebra that, that kind of work in different places. Right? You can sort of think of this as an operating system with different, uh, different hardware. Right? So today, remember, our, our unknowns now aren't numbers anymore, they're functions. And in fact, there's a corresponding linear algebra of functions. And this makes a lot of sense, right? If I add two functions together, I get a third function. If I multiply a function by seven, then I still have some function, yeah? So that means it's a, it's a vector space. And in fact, you can put a, uh, a metric, or rather uh, an, an, an inner product on that, that vector space. Okay. Now what do we do when we take the dot product of two vectors? Effectively, remember, we're just like multiplying them component by component and adding them all together. Well, if I want to take the dot product to two functions, I can basically multiply them component by component, and that's just at every single x now. There are a lot of components, a lot of x's. And, and sort of the continuous analog of summing stuff up is to take an inner product. And so we can call this the inner product of two functions, and it measures their overlap. And remember that example that I drew here in since erased, where you have different polynomials and they kind of start to look similar? One way to do that would be to just find the dot product between different polynomials using this, this inner product formula here. And you'll see that, that in fact, it, they, they get very close to parallel in this L2 product. So anyway, when we talk about understanding um, the quality of interpolatory schemes and so on, right, we can still use the language of least squares. Right? In particular, this dot product gives me a norm of a function. Right? If I do f dot product itself, right? so this is the integral of f squared, that's like the two norm of a function, right? So one thing I could do would be say, okay, and in fact, this is what the theory of interpolation does. It says, how well am I approximating a function in a least square sense, right? So if I have this sum of all these polynomial terms, and I subtract off what f of x actually is, right? I can take the norm of that difference, and I want it to be small, right? And for certain polynomial bases, it will be, and for other ones, it won't. Right? And so anyway, to just give you a small taste of that theory, that's basically what's going on. And in fact, you can play all kinds of linear algebra games and get some really interesting results. So for example, uh, just like on the homework that's due today, you took the Gram-Schmidt algorithm and you extended it to A orthogonal things, you can similarly plug in this functional dot product and make a set of functions orthonormal to one another. And in fact, this gives you a very famous set of different polynomials, depending on the dot product you choose. So the, uh, the, I can never say this game, the guy's name right, the Lagrange polynomials are gotten based on taking the inner product I had on the previous slide and, and just running Gram-Schmidt on those, on, those, on those polynomials. In fact, you can write down a set of orthogonal polynomials in closed form that way. Now, why would I want to do that? It's actually kind of an interesting question. 
So in our next lecture, we're going to talk about how to, <laughs> if, I, if I prepare, we're going to talk about how to approximate the integral of a function, for example. Right? So what will be the least square? So, so let's say that I wrote down the, uh, the Legendre polynomial, so like L1, L2, L3, some sequence. Right? We can just compute this. Graham Schmidt is an algorithm. In fact, there's a Rovner bases and all kinds of things dealing with algebra to, to, to do this. Uh, and, 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 and now I'd like, I have some f of x, and I'd like the least square approximation of him in some set of these orthogonal polynomials. Well, we know how to project onto orthogonal things, right? The, uh, the least squares projection of f of x, right? It's going to be f tilde x, right? And it's just going to be the inner product of f and li over the inner product of li, li times li of x. Right? This is just the orthogonal projection formula that we've already had in this class applied to orthonormal polynomials, which is kind of a funny thing to think about. But the, the nice thing is that these, these inner products, are they're hiding an integral. And if you can approximate that integral, then you can approximate a least square spin for an orthonormal basis. Now, the monomials are not orthonormal, and that formula no longer applies. You have to do something more complicated. Yeah? Anyway, um, all this is just to say that there, there are different bases. One thing you could do would be to extend our inner product just a little bit by saying the inner product of f, g, with respect to a function w, would be just the integral of f times g times w, where w is some positive thing. Turns out that's still an inner product on function space. And in fact, if you make this very special function w of x, right, this looks like a, a circle, yeah, a one over a circle, I guess. Then you get a set of polynomials called the Chebyshev polynomials, which are actually can be written in a really funny way. They can be written as cosine of k times arc cosine of x. It turns out this thing is a polynomial in x, and it's called the Chebyshev polynomial. It's this guy right here. In the course notes, I go through a little bit of the uh, fun facts about Chebyshev. But because it has this nice form, it talks very nicely to Fourier theorem, uh, Fourier theory. And it helps you to avoid those weird oscillatory artifacts that we were mentioning before, because sort of you know that the oscillations of these functions are well behaved. Yeah. So anyway, obviously it's a very high-level sketch, but it's a very interesting theory, and I encourage you to read about it. Right? So you can answer questions like, what is the least squares approximation of a function in a set of polynomials? And then the last thing that I'll mention, and this is developed in the course notes, maybe I'll have you do some of this on homework, is uh, one question is. How well can you approximate a function with, with the different, you know, different classes of, of bases? And one nice thing you do is say, well, you know, if I have different spacing between my, my piecewise constant or piecewise linear basis functions, I should get a better approximation as that spacing shrinks, right? Because somehow I'm sampling f at more and more points. And you can show that, that the quality of your approximation depends on the spacing between these in different ways. So, so as you might expect, a piecewise linear function can be better approximated, at least if that function is smooth, uh, is, a, is a better way to approximate a smooth function than, than with piecewise constant, which you kind of already knew, but you do need to go, to go home and double check. So anyway, it's a very high level, one lecture overview of a very large field of interpolation. Uh, the, the lecture notes do at least work out the examples that I've mentioned in class in some detail, including the theory, and I encourage you, and in fact your textbook actually works out in more detail. Uh, and if you'd like some more references, I can provide them, but it's some really interesting stuff, and, and, and very worthwhile to make sure that what you're doing is actually well behaved, and so on. So anyway, with that we'll stop. On uh, Wednesday we're going to talk about how to approximate integrals and derivatives of functions. You can see this is quite different from... Uh, the last several weeks of F205. And then we'll basically conclude the class by talking about differential equations. And that's it. So anyway, if somebody could uh, get the phone on this thing, then we'll be all done.